Okay guys, this is the video for Unit 3, Liquids and Solids. Here we're going to be focusing primarily on the intermolecular forces that are present in the molecules. We're going to be tying this into the organic unit that we just finished and really looking at how those organic molecules um, exhibit forces between one another and how that will influence their properties and reactivity. So again, this learning outcome I actually have under both, it is a VCCS learning outcome. I have it both under the organic unit and under this unit on liquids and solids because it applies to both. So we're going to be looking at the molecular structure and relating it back to the properties of compounds. Also in this video we're going to be discussing intermolecular forces and we're going to be looking at how those forces vary in strength. We're going to be identifying which forces are present in a uh, molecule and then we're going to explain well a little bit of hydrogen bonding but that'll continue into the next video as well. So for this unit this video all we're going to be working on really is uh, the little bit of Chem 111 review just kind of how does matter and molecules interact with one another and then we're going to go straight into some liquids. We're going to start looking at the intramolecular forces and compare those to the intermolecular forces. So remember back to 111. In the gas unit we talk a lot about the kinetic molecular theory. In that uh, unit we talk about how gases are in constant motion and so on. The, the thing is the kinetic molecular theory actually relates to all phases of matter because all matter is in motion. The only exception to that is when you're at absolute zero, which you know we're, we're not going to deal with right now. The amount of motion that each type of particle exists, uh, that it exhibits, is going to have to deal with the, the, the energy that it has. And that's directly related to the Kelvin temperature. If you can kind of think back to 111, there was that really big formula with velocity where we related it to both mass and temperature. Here we just I just want you to know that the hotter it is the more it moves. It's also going to depend on the state of matter. We've said before that solids are rigid. All that's happening here is some vibrations. If you think back to my 111 video I have a uh, video of people on a train really jammed in and how they can't move past one another. There's just a little bit of vibration, aka breathing, on that train. For a liquid, there's still a lot of close-knit particles there, but they are able to move past one another. We're going to really deal with that in this unit. And then for the gases, uh, we will talk more about gases later, but this does really tie into 111. In 111, we spend a lot of time on gas, and in 112, we're going to continue into these two phases of matter. Now, the idea here, guys, is gases are really far apart, liquids and solids are close together. So for these two phases of matter, the, because those particles are close together, they are going to be able to interact more, okay? Now, if you think back to um, just any example of where you have walked down the hall, if you see, you know, a friend on the far end of the hallway, you might be able to wave which is pretty much all that a gas can do. They're so far apart they don't really see each other. But if you're in a jam-packed hallway or in class sitting next to somebody, you're going to have a little bit more interaction. You can't just ignore somebody that's, you know, right there. And so it's those interactions that we are going to really focus on in this video. Now, um, hopefully the videos will work. I ha I'm having a little bit of issue technology-wise, um, so I'm going to try it on this computer. So the idea behind the kinetic molecular theory is that particles are in constant motion. Now, the, because the energy is related to... Hmm... Because the energy is related to, um, there we go, the temperature, why will this not, there we go, 
um, it is going to uh, there. Ha. Huh. Okay. So because the particle movement is related to temperature, the hotter it is, the more those particles are going to move. Okay. Now we can also kind of make assumptions based off how strong or how weak those intermolecular forces are. When they are weak, they kind of do their own thing. Increasing the molecular forces, um, intermolecular forces, is going to cause slight aggregation and eventually they are just going to form a complete uh, unit. And so you can kind of see here, even though they're in motion, as the forces become stronger, they will also um, affect how those particles are situated. Now, we can also look at how in a liquid we can uh, monitor where those particles go. This is actually in your, your supplemental reading. It's really fantastic. And so here we've got a molecule that's traced in li the liquid phase. And you can kind of see, yeah, it moves past one another, past other molecules, but there's not really any systematic movement to it. It's completely random. It's in constant motion. It can get hung up with, you know, interactions up here, but eventually, you know, they can move past one another. Now, well, until today, we have talked primarily about intramolecular forces, okay? Intra, just like an intrastate, has to deal with things that are occurring inside. So we've been dealing with ionic and covalent bonding. We talked about how ionic bonds occur between metals and nonmetals. Covalent bonding is going to be two nonmetals or a lesser difference in electronegativity. And you can have either nonpolar covalent bonding where the electronegativity is the exact same or it's going to be polar where they have different amounts of preference for pulling those electrons to them, okay? So these intramolecular forces are exceptionally strong. They hold a molecule, they hold these atoms together. It's really, really hard to break those. Intermolecular forces, on the other hand, are going to be the interactions between two or more separate particles. This is just like an interstate. You go from one state to another. It's from one molecule to another. These are much, much weaker, guys. They are not going to be able to keep all of the molecules together. That if they, if they were as strong, we would not see water evaporate out of a glass. We would not see the, the ability of things to aggregate or to separate as much as we do. So intermolecular forces are only going to be significant in those phases of matter where the particles are very close together, okay? That means really it's only liquids and solids, aka that's why we're talking about it here. So the stronger forces the stronger the forces, the higher the melting point, the higher the boiling point is going to go. And that is going to allow us to make predictions about the properties of a molecule just by looking to see which types of intermolecular forces are present. Now, if we consider, I've got these listed from weak to strong. The weakest intermolecular force is called London dispersion. Occasionally in literature, it's still called Van der Waals forces. So you might see these two, but they're interchangeable terms here. I typically stick to London dispersion um, because that seems to be the new model, but those terms are both used to mean the same thing. Then there's dipole-dipole forces, which are pretty strong. The strongest type of dipole-dipole force is hydrogen bonding. Okay, that's, there it goes. So let's look at the London dispersion forces. These are the weakest of all intermolecular forces, and it's present in everything. No matter what molecule we're talking about, it has London dispersion. It is a force that results from a temporary dipole, a temporary unequal sharing of electrons. And so something like CO2 or methane, 
where we would consider that to be a completely nonpolar molecule because all of the bonds, you know, would cancel out, can be temporarily disturbed. Think about, you know, a, a, um, a friend that might be in a good mood all the time. You can still irritate them sometimes. And so we, just like, you know, a random bad mood, a molecule can have a random bad distribution of electrons, okay? Now, these are really, really weak. The only thing that will allow them to be strong is increasing molar, molar mass. The bigger the molar mass of the molecule, the bigger the London dispersion force. And so here I've got a couple of things. Um, just within the halogens, we have, you know, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Um, remember, these are all halogens. Uh, so they, they're also Hofbrinkles, which means that they are going to bond to each other. They're present diatomically, okay? So as these increase, mol molar mass gets bigger, melting point and boiling point also increase. That is just um, how it works. Now, the other thing that can affect London dispersion forces is the amount of surface area. And so if you are really kind of rolled up and condensed, what's going to happen is you have less attraction, you have less ability to reach out and grab or interact with a, another molecule, okay? And these are, I mean, this is like essentially a ball. I mean, they would just bounce around. It's no big deal. As you start to spread out, the stronger those intermolecular forces get, the stronger the London dispersion forces, and your boiling point is going to increase. Now, if you look at uh, even within another family, again, we have slight atomic radius increase here, or actually a big one, within the same family. As the molar mass gets bigger, the boiling point also gets bigger, okay? Okay, so the stronger attractions are going to be a very similar type of arrangement where you have an unequal sharing of electrons. So you have a partial negative and a partial positive side. The difference here is that that distribution is permanent. It's not going to be there for a split second. Instead, it's going to be a more permanent arrangement. And because of that, it is going to allow us to really see um, a more lasting interaction, which is going to have a bigger effect on boiling point, melting point, and so on. Now, if we look at um, where these types of, types of interactions are going to be, they're going to be in molecules that are polar, things like an alcohol things like uh, halo hydrocarbons where the halogens don't, you know, cancel each other out. They're going to be present in those t categories of molecules that are more polar. Now, if you look, the strongest type of dipole-dipole is going to result from hydrogen bonding. Now, hydrogen bonding is not a covalent bond. Instead, it's going to be present in molecules that contain either an NH, OH or SH bond, and FH also kind of counts, counts in there. Now, there's a little bit of debate in the literature. Sometimes you only see three of the four. Sometimes you see all four. So I want you to make sure that you guys have seen all of these. You know, SH bonds occur primarily in like cysteines, proteins, um, thiol compounds. Um, OH bonds, you know, we have the alcohols, we have carboxylic acids all those types of compounds that we dealt with in the last unit. And amines, NH bonds are really almost as strong as those OH bonds. The idea is you have a highly electronegative atom with bonding to a hydrogen, which wants to donate its electron density. So you get a really strong partial negative on the electronegative 
atom and a partial positive on the hydrogens. That is going to allow for interactions between the two partials, okay? And so like, you know, partial positive, partial negative. Well, usually if you have an OH bond, the electron pairs on oxygen, the electron pair on nitrogen or on sulfur will interact with the partial positive on the neighboring, on the the hydrogens of the neighboring molecules. And so usually you can actually have several interactions. You can see this oxygen is interacting with this water and it's probably going to be interacting with something up here as well. It ends up keeping those molecules really well connected. They're not covalent bonds, they're not as strong as that, but because of these, all of these interactions, you tend to be more close-knit. And so water has a lot of properties that we're going to be discussing uh, this unit and really for a while that allow it to behave differently than we might expect. It's got a very low molar mass. The London dispersion force in water is very, very low, but it has this hydrogen bonding, which is a type of dipole-dipole, that is really, really strong, okay? So if we look at, there it goes, um, things that have hydrogen bonding compared to things that do not. Um, now, remember guys, the bigger you get, the stronger your London dispersion, but um, those hydrogen bonds do not account for as much as you would think. So here we've got H2S, HCl, and pH3, there we go. Um, as you get bigger, the, mol the boiling point goes up, but the point that I want you to see here is that things that have hydrogen bonding, H2S, um, while they do go up with molar mass, hydrogen bonding has an effect. You can kind of see this is not linear. This is not, you know, quite linear. Now, even more important, guys, if you really consider how the hydrogen bonding in H2O, HF, and H3, these have really small molar masses compared to these. So you would expect the boiling points, the melting points, to be down here, but they're not. The reason that these hold together in the liquid phase so well is because of hydrogen bonding. And same thing, guys. I know that not everywhere is including the H2S, the HS bonds. I still do because I know it has a huge impact in biology. And when you get into biology, or if you have to, and you start talking about cysteines and the role that those proteins play, you've got to consider that the hydrogen bonding that's happening there. So I still consider this a hydrogen bond even though the effect is much smaller than these three. Okay. Now let's go ahead and kind of look at what this means. Now inside your supplemental reading there's a ton of videos and these are really really great but I don't just want to reference you there and so what I ended up doing is I did a screen recording and inserted these so that you could kind of see me playing with them but go in really and enjoy it, like play with it, see how the forces um, work. So here I've got two nonpolar molecules. Nonpolar molecules means the only thing that's present is London dispersion. You can kind of see like they separated really, really well. On the other hand, two, non -po two polar molecules, you can see that there's a little bit more difficulty in pulling those two things apart and that's because of the dipole-dipole attraction. In fact, if you get really good at this, you can kind of sit it close to each other and you'll see it like pull towards, um, they will actually orient the way they want. And um, anyway, now if you have a polar and a nonpolar, the only two things that this, the only thing that these two molecules have in common is London dispersion. And so there's really not much attraction here. It's just um, a matter of, breaking the London dispersion force, okay? Now, if we were to look at molecules that have a different polarity, what's really kind of neat here is that um, 
we can, there it goes, we can look at the attraction between things that have low polarity, medium polarity, or high polarity. Something that is only slightly polar, like maybe an ether, um, remember oxygen has, if it, it forms two bonds, it's going to have that bond angle of about 109.5, and so it's going to end up being kind of polar, slightly anyway. And so you can kind of consider molecules of low polarity. Mostly it's going to be London dispersion, but there's a little bit of dipole-dipole in there depending on how they're oriented. And you can kind of see these will also pull towards one another. The bigger difference, though, comes in when you start increasing that polarity. So as you go to a medium polarity, it gets a little bit harder to pull them apart. And more importantly, like they are going to, even from a big distance, pull towards one another. And you can see it's even faster. It's almost like a zipper effect. As soon as they interact, they want to... Uh, or as soon as they sense each other. It's kind of like if somebody tells you that your best friend just got, you know, somewhere like down the hall, you're going to go find them, right? Um, and you can see it even now moving slowly. It's still trying to orient and it's going to zipper right to each other. So then if you go to a high polarity, this is a really polar molecule. It's going to be really hard to pull apart those dipoles because there's so much polarity. And no matter where they are, um, they are going to eventually uh, pull together, although it's, I forgot that this one didn't really cooperate. It's really interesting. So you have the mouse and the little star is on a, like a spring system. But you can see this, even from a greater distance, found each other. They interacted that way, okay? So the higher the polarity, the bigger the dipole, the... Uh, stronger the intermolecular forces. Now we can also look at hydrogen bonding. This was you know one of my least favorite videos. Um, the point being it's kind of hard to see all of the hydrogen bonds when you go until you go slow motion. But you can see that almost all of these waters has more than one hydrogen bond occurring at all times. And if you start heating it up even though the molecules move faster they still prefer to interact with one another. They don't want to be off by their on their own the way a nonpolar molecule would. It wants to really um, continue to interact. Now, if we look at uh, this is kind of an application quiz, okay? And so the idea here is um, you should consider the type of attractions than that these molecules are going to have and then you can test yourself by playing around. So go ahead and hit pause and think about two H2 molecules. What kind of interactions do they have? At this point I'm going to assume that you have pressed play and you should realize that H2 it's two atoms of itself bonded together. Um, it's nonpolar and two nonpolar molecules, the only intermolecular forces they have are um, London dispersion forces. And so these are going to be really weak interactions. It's going to allow these molecules to be pulled apart very quickly. And so you can kind of test that. There it goes. And there's no interaction, there's no attraction between these molecules whatsoever. Now go ahead and hit consider BR2, BR2, and kind of consider what type of interactions they have. Again, at this point, I'm going to assume you've hit pause. Again, we have two nonpolar molecules. The only interactions they can have are London dispersion forces. And so you can pull them apart easily, but more importantly, they're not going to try to come back together. Now go ahead and consider HBr and HBr. Here we've got hydrogen, which is on the left of the periodic table, Br, which is on the right. There's going to be a high difference of electronegativity. And so this is going to be a polar molecule. So you have two polar molecules interacting. Um, so you have both London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces. Now this is not hydrogen bonding. There is no OH. There is no 
NH. There's no FH bond here. HBr is not going to exhibit hydrogen bonding. It only has dipole-dipole and London dispersion. And so if I hit play here, you can kind of see not only do these molecules take a little bit more energy to break apart because of that dipole. Come on. There you go. But they will also orient themselves very well. Okay. In fact, these are highly polar, and so if you if they're close enough together, they will actually interact um, and pull together. Kind of like that. Okay, so last example, H2 and Br. Here we've got a nonpolar molecule and a polar molecule. Only thing that these guys can do together is London dispersion. And so you can kind of see, like, you have to be exceptionally close before, um, actually, that interacted with the star. I don't think it's supposed to do that. Um, London dispersion is very weak. It's only going to pull together a little bit. It's not like those polar molecules that we were seeing. Okay, so if you consider... Hold on. One of my slides isn't showing up. Let's do this. At this point, you have a slide that says, um, there it goes. What intermolecular forces are present in the following molecules? I went ahead and wrote the structures down. Go ahead and hit pause and try to do that because that is a really good review from the organic unit, okay? Um, once you've done that, go ahead and hit play again and we're going to move into those. So let's go through these one at a time. Personally, I really like to see... Um, the molecule, molecular structure while I'm typing this, but that's just me. And so um, let's go ahead and zoom this in. Good enough. Um, get rid of this and we'll get rid of that. So if we consider these molecules, ethanoic acid, we know just because it exists, there's London dispersion. We also know because there is this oxygen on this side but not over here, there's got to be dipole-dipole forces. And finally, we know because of this OH bond that ethanoic acid can, exhi can exhibit hydrogen bonding. Let's move that over a little bit. Okay, so let's go into the next one, um, ethanol. Ethanol, again, it, it's a molecule, so it has to have London dispersion. It has an oxygen on this side. It doesn't cancel. Um, the bond angles around this oxygen are going to be about 109. And so there's a polar end here, so this is going to have dipole-dipole. And then because there is an OH bond, there is going to be hydrogen bonding. Now, if we look at ethanol, ethanol is a little bit different because it does have London dispersion. I'm going to stop there. Um, it does have... Um, a little bit of a dipole because of this oxygen right here. Maybe not as great as um, like up here where there's two, but still it's got a good dipole dipole. But there's no hydrogen bonding. There, there is hydrogen, there is oxygen, but they're not bonded together. So there's no hydrogen bonding here. Okay, so let's go up to dimethylamine. Uh, which should be all one word. Silly me. Now, if you look at this molecule, it is a molecule, so it must have London dispersion. 
And nitrogen right here is much more polar than the carbons. So this is a polar molecule, which means it has a dipole-dipole interaction. And it does have um, this NH bond that's required for hydrogen bonding. So it can exhibit H bonding. Now, if we look at propanone, again, kind of remember, guys, anytime a carbon only has three areas of electron density, this sp2 hybridization, bond angles here are 120. I cannot tell you how hard it is to draw all that in three dimensions on here, but it should be bond angles of about 120. So you have a polar end up here, nonpolar end down here, and it ends up being um, not only is there London dispersion, there is also going to be uh, a dipole. Now, same as with dimethylamine, there's no hydrogen bonded to oxygen. Instead, it is just oxygen, it's just electronegative, that's all there is. So there's no hydrogen bonding here. Trimethylamine, it's a molecule, so it must have London dispersion. Um, now, it's really hard to see this, but if you think about nitrogen, Nitrogen technically has, uh, if you were to do the Lewis structure here, it's got two electrons up here and then one on each of three sides. So even though the three bonds are visible, you really can't see the lone pair. So technically, this is going to be polar. This is an sp3 hybridization around that nitrogen. And so you do end up getting um, a little bit of a dipole, dipole interaction here. Unlike the dimethylamine, though, we no longer have an NH bond. So this guy cannot exhibit hydrogen bonding. Okay, so then let's go over to ethane. Ethane is completely nonpolar, uh, so there's London dispersion. And that's it. Um, there's no dipole here. Remember we said carbon hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. There's really no difference in electronegativity. Um, there's no dipole. There's no OH, SH, FH, NH bond. So there cannot be hydrogen bonding. Now let's carry this a step further and consider what we know about these molecules. Let's make an assumption about their properties. Let's go into, oh right. There it goes, sorry. Um, which of these would you consider to have high versus low melting points? Now I'm not going to give you like a list this long on your exam. Instead, what I really want you to know is should it be high or should it be low? Okay? And we can kind of go through this one at a time and consider the intermolecular forces that are present. For example, ethanoic acid we know has uh, hydrogen bonding in addition to the other two. So this should be a high melting point. Same thing with ethanol, this should be high. This did not have hydrogen bonding, it only had that dipole uh, force, so it's going to be kind of medium, okay? Dimethylamine, here we have um, an, uh, hydrogen bonding again, so this is going to be high. Propanone, if we go back to propanone, there we go, propanone, we have a dipole, but no, um, what's it called, uh, no hydrogen bonding, there we go, sorry. So again, we've got kind of a medium style melting point. Trimethylamine, there was no hydrogen bonding here. Instead, um, it was only dipole interaction, so it's again going to be kind of medium. Ethane would be low because there was only London dispersion. 
Now, guys, keep in mind, when we say hi, we are really just referring to from these intermolecular forces. This has absolutely nothing to do with, you know, the types of interactions that are going to occur in like an ionic compound. So if you had an ionic compound, that would be the highest by far. Next highest would be something that has two or more H bonds. Like water or methylamine. There you've got two NH bonds, here you've got two OH bonds, and so you can kind of really consider having a high, high uh, melting point. Now, same thing, if you have really good dipoles, well, you know, one hydrogen bond, um, really strong dipoles would also cause a little bit higher of a melting point. And then the lowest is only going to have London dispersion. And so if I were to rank a compound, I'm going to look for something that's ionic first. Then I'm going to look for something that has hydrogen bonding and specifically look to see if there's something that has more than one OH bond, more than one NH bond. Um, then I'm going to look for, is there hydrogen bonding at all? Is there a dipole? Is it a polar molecule? And then finally, is it, only have London dispersion. And so this is kind of like the highest down to the lowest um, melting points here. Okay. Now just in this video what we have really done oops, is go through the phases of matter and discuss the intermolecular forces. In your sample test and in your MSQs, you're going to be predicting what intermolecular forces are present in a molecule and you're going to be relating them to to properties such as boiling points. In the next video, we're going to start talking about other properties of liquids, including surface tension and viscosity, vapor pressure. We're going to come back and relate those intermolecular forces to those properties of liquid. Okay? And so as you work through this unit, remember that really it's all based on intermolecular forces.